we're free. Yes, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. Yes, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free. Amen. When death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began. Good morning, good morning. Hey, we're going to stay in that place of worship, but uh, for right now, I'll let you know we're going to sing a few more songs. We get to celebrate a baptism this morning. How exciting is that? We got a great message by Matthew and Amy, and then we'll get a chance to pray together. So I'm gonna ask us to stand and pray, and we're gonna to continue to worship together. Lord, this morning, we just come into a place of surrender. God, as we're on Labor Day weekend, and lots of people are out and busy, but this morning, we're here and in this place. And it's in you, Jesus, we find freedom. And so this morning, as we continue to lift up praise, as we start a posture towards you, God, will you speak to us this morning? We open our hearts to you and we do all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. When death was arrested in my life, ash was removed. May only mercy remain. My orphan heart was given. to dance, oh, when death was arrested and my life began, oh, oh your grace so free washes over me, you have made me new, now life begins with you. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully Well, he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Oh, when death was arrested and my life began. Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Your grace so free washes over me. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. 
It's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made us new now Like we begins with you Oh, we're free, free Forever we're free Come join the song of all the redeemed yes. We're free Jesus, we are so grateful. We are so grateful that you have made life new and you have made us new in you. daily bread this is my daily bread your very word spoken to me I'm desperate for you and I
This is the air I breathe. Yes, you are. Your holy presence, living in me. Yes, you are my daily bread, Jesus. You are my daily. My daily bread, your very word spoken in me, and I and I, I'm desperate for you, desperate for.
is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all and all thrones and dominions all powers and positions to our name stands above them all and the angels cry creation have a seat. We're going to continue worship uh, just in a different way with baptisms. Baptism is a, it's an inward expression of a faith that's saying, Lord, here I am. I'm choosing to follow you. My old life is gone. There is a new life before me. The young man we're baptizing this morning came to me last week because we're uh, celebrating baptisms and brunch uh, next week as we go back to two services. But uh, he said, I want to get baptized this weekend. I'm like, why the rush? He's like, well, I'm getting deployed and I'm going to go visit my family, so let's get her done. And I said, when are you leaving? He's like, right after church, I'm jumping on a plane. I said, let's fill up the tank and get it done. So Hunter, I'm going to ask you to come up. You haven't been here for baptisms. We just love to let you know that we're here as a church family, that we're praying and we're coming together and it's, it's a family celebration. So Hunter, I know you love being up front. I don't want to steal his uh, thunder this morning, but he um, stationed at Fairchild, but he came in right away and just started to get involved. And he serves on our live media stream, and he just helps out, and he's here, so he's just been a, a huge blessing. So we're going to miss him as he's gone for the next few months. So Hunter, can you, now, if I didn't ruin everything, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm from uh, Nixon, Missouri. It's uh, just five miles south of Springfield, and um, I was born and raised there in Nixon, Missouri, and you know, I joined the Air Force not too long ago, uh, just June of last year, and uh, I got here January this year, and been coming here ever since I got here. And I just uh, I found my community here, and um, I'm glad to be getting baptized here within my community. I loved your your faith story and your journey. Can you tell us a little bit about when you made Jesus like your savior? When you started choosing to fall to walk him, walk with him. 
So whenever I was in BMT or uh, basic military training, I went to uh, one of the Sunday services and uh, they were singing uh, Reckless, uh, Reckless Love. And uh, I just felt the hand of God there with me. And ever since then, I've wanted to walk closer with Jesus. Can you tell us why you want to get baptized today? So I want it to be another step in my faith and my expression in my faith in God. And I want it to be my, uh, my next step in obedience for, uh, for Jesus. Yeah. All right. Uh, Hunter is part of the Shiree Life Group. So, Bob, are you here today, too, your family? You to, come on up. I know he's on the prayer team anyway, so... If you want to uh, pray, what we're going to do is ask if the church, if you want to come, we'd like to lay on hands. We're just going to like seal this moment, that God sees this moment, he knows this moment, he's putting his hand on Hunter, and so if you want to come up and pray over him, I'm going to ask Bob to lead out the prayer, and then I'm going to close it in prayer. So, come on in. Bob, here's the mic. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the inspiration I've had from getting to know Hunter. And Lord God, the thoughts I had before coming this morning, just thinking about fresh out of high school, into the Air Force, comes here and seeks out fellowship, has got involved in so many different things. Um, as Pastor Jacobs mentioned, being a part of the sound team, young adults, and our life group, which has brought lots of joy to us. So, Father God, in Jesus' name, I praise you that Hunter has taken this brave, step of obedience to go forward with water baptism. Father God, I just believe you have some amazing, exciting, awesome plans for his life. And so in Jesus' name, we just pray for your continued hand upon him, and we praise you for this privilege. In Jesus' name. Lord, as a community of faith, as Bob said, we just stand and declare that this is, a, this is your day. And this is a day that hunters remember that there's a new chapter. And God, as he is serving with those men and women around him, God, let him to continue to be a light. God, he is a walking representation of Jesus, you on earth. And so let him be Jesus uh, when he's working, when he's off, when he's home, and it's in all those different areas, God, that he brings Jesus with him. And as a church, uh, we stand in with him and we pray and intercede for him, keep him safe, bless him as he's on this new journey of faith and discovery. God, be with him. We just believe for all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. All right. We're going to continue to worship, and uh, we'll go to the tank. I love baptisms. They are that that public declaration that Jesus is Lord and that his name is high above everything else. So let's sing that as we're supporting Hunter in this. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Your name. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. And all thrones. And dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Your name is the highest, your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all Positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, Holy, the creation cry, Holy, you are lifted high, Holy, Holy forever. 
you are holy forever. And we just make that declaration here today. That you are high and lifted up above all, all principalities, all powers, all thrones, all positions, all dominions. And that includes the ones that are in our lives. Lord, where there are strong towers, where there are high places, things that we may have set up, things that we may have made idols. Lord, whether it's our, our work, our activities, our play, our politics, whatever it is, whatever we have set up, God, we want to make you king and Lord over it all. And just lift you high. Lord, be our strong tower. I'm desperate for you and I I'm lost without you and I desperate for you for you and for you alone and I I'm lost without you as we switch gears here, we do not want to let go of this place, Jesus. We want to continue to listen to the words that you have for us, the words that, that you have to speak. Lord, I just pray that your anointing would flow this morning through Matthew and Amy as they come up here to share with us. God, we know that you've put anointed words on their hearts. Open our ears to hear. Good morning. I was pushing buttons <clears throat> on the laptop just now, and Amy's like, Matthew. Which, um, <laughs> for those in the, in the audience, is exactly a perfect representation of how our morning has gone, of this tension of, of how smooth I want things to go, and God in the mix that says, be fluid, Amy, be flexible, Amy, Everything's going to be just fine, Amy. And I say, but Lord, it's not going according to my plan. So you, that was wonderful. It's okay, Amy. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we're Matthew and Amy, and um, we are almost pastors. So um, just give a little bit of background. So Amy and I have been going through our church's licensing process, and we're like, almost complete. We're not quite, so we're not like legit yet, but 
I was telling a buddy of mine at work, I'm like, I can almost marry and bury. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we have had a fun, fun summer, fun weekend. Yes, and if you are unaware, this is our last summer service where we are at one service. Next week, we go back to two services at 8.30 and 10.30. So if you want to see a really good time, show up extra early, and my kids will be rolling around feral on the floor at 7 mm -hmm. in the morning. It's a good time. And we give you a job to do. We're, we're back to showing up at church in our pajamas. <laughs> so <laughs> instead of having time to get ready in the morning. So, but you know, we've, we've had a great summer. We did something that Amy absolutely loves doing, something I've uh, learned to love learned doing. To, no, something I love too, and it like melds, and that is we were at the fair yesterday. We went up to Ferry County in the metropolitan town of Republic, um, which I love. Was it uh, Colville or Chewila? One of the towns that's like population 1,664 Kettle. people. And one grouch. <laughs> that's that's their. That's, yep. Yeah, get them all. There we go. Exactly. But yeah. going up to the Ferry County Fair is one of those silly things that is like the earmark on my summer that I absolutely love doing. It is a little bit of a trek, a solid two and a half hour drive, close to close to three from our house. Um, but I've got cousins that live up that way, and it's just. Fun. It's a fun day, and our three-year-old, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen her running around, and if you haven't, you will, um, because she's all over the place. She, in her head, thinks that she is horse crazy. She, in her mind, has decided that she likes horses. There's one thing, though, that is different between being actually horse crazy and thinking you're horse crazy. So one of my favorite things that we do at the fair is we throw her up on my cousin's horse before she has a chance to, to realize how tall a horse is. <laughs> because Grace at three is very short, and horses are a lot taller than any animal she has ever been around. And she doesn't really know what to do with herself when she realizes how actually big a horse is. And, and just kind of breaking the ice and throwing her up there has been the best way we know how to just acclimate her um, because she doesn't know what to do. She gets overwhelmed with awe at the sight of this horse that is a million times bigger than she is. And it's so much bigger than the carousel horse, too, that she really was enjoying. Um, but, you know, when we think of things that we have to confront, it really falls into line with our uh, spot that we are in Acts. As a church, we've been going through the book of Acts, and we're almost halfway there. Uh, there's 28 books or chapters in the book of Acts. We're at chapter 12 this weekend, and uh, we get to see how the church confronts uh, struggles and tensions and how things that knock them in their, uh, stop them in their tracks and how God shows up. So with that, we're going to um, hop into chapter 12 the book of Acts, and uh, right off at verse 1, it says this. About the time King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some of the believers in the church. I just want to stop right there. So give you a little bit of um, context of uh, King Herod Agrippa. Think the neighbor boy from Toy Story that likes to like, blow, thing, blow the toys up. Like that is, that is King Agrippa to the T. He like sees that the other Jews like it when he persecutes the other Jews or the, the Christians. He's like, ooh, let's do it again. Let's do it again. It's like good thing they didn't have microwaves and kitty cats around at that point because <laughs> he probably would have been that person. Anyways, uh, verse 2 says this. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed at the sword. And when Herod saw how much that pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. And when he imprisoned him, placing him under guard of four squads of four soldiers each, Herod intended to bring Peter out for public tri trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. So what, what's happening here in, this, in the first five verses? We see King Herod persecuting believers. This, this kind of isn't new to us. That's what we're seeing a lot of in Acts in the early church, is that believers have seasons of immense success going out, and then they have seasons of persecution where, where the king is saying, no, you will not spread the word of God, or the Jewish population is saying, no, you will not, because it threatens their social structure that they're familiar with. 
And leading up to exactly this point, they had been in a season of wins. The church had been doing a lot of things really well. They had been growing and expanding and just sharing the news of Jesus wherever they went. And so it makes sense that they're going to enter into a season of persecution. King Herod persecutes believers essentially to win the popular vote because he knows that it will please the Jewish population in his land. He knows that it will keep them in his good graces um, and he knows it'll be well received. And we see James murdered as if it was nothing. So it's, it's not anything off of their back to continue persecuting believers. But what does the church do? How does the church respond to this season of persecution that they're being entered into? In verse 5, we see, while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The church begins praying for Peter, and you might be thinking, what's the big deal? Isn't that what the church is supposed to do? We're supposed to be people who pray? What's so special about that? And, and the thing is, is we have to remember when we're reading the New Testament, we are reading a translated scripture. It wasn't written in English. And so we read earnestly and think, oh, it just means that they prayed a lot. And that's not what it means at all. We miss so much nuance from the Greek that takes place. And if we're reading in verse 5, the original word for earnestly you see is called ektenos. And it's only used one other time in the entire New Testament, which means it's a big deal which means that it was used super intentionally, which means it's saying something that we need to turn our ears to. It doesn't just mean that the church prayed a lot. It means something very particular is happening in how the church is praying and that we need to be doing exactly that. Otherwise, they wouldn't have used a word that would catch everyone's attention. The verb ektenos literally means the image of giving something so stretched out that it is taut, that there's tension there, that there is capability to visibly see the tension that is being created in something being stretched out to the end of its limits. Think, think of when you have a rubber band and you pull it tight and then someone comes along and pulls it a little more. That's what ektenos is. Ektenos is what happens when you come to the end of yourself. And God says, you're not there yet. Let's go further. Ectonos is what happens when you don't think you have anything left. And God says, you don't, but I do. Yeah. Come with me. That is how the church was praying. They weren't just praying a lot. They saw that Peter was in prison and they reached the ends of themselves for Peter. They came undone for Peter. They lived in this tension where they knew that there was nothing more they could do, but God could do that. And, and I wonder, how, how often do we read earnestly and we say, but God, I'm praying a lot. God, I'm praying a lot for a circumstance in my life. But we haven't reached the ends of ourselves yet. How often do we say, God, why aren't you showing up? I've been asking you. But we're not undone. We haven't reached the point that God says, let me show up in the spot where you didn't think there was more. And what would it look like if we started living in this tension of being so visibly taught that we're undone and we still say, God, do a work. And that's our big idea this morning, that miracles live in the tension of our lives. See, something happens when we get to the ends of ourselves and when we invite out of pure necessity for God to come and to take over and to take us further than we thought we could. When we're pushed to our limits and we allow the Holy Spirit to give us the true empowerment that we also crave. But it starts with being completely done. And that's what we see that the church did it. See, because when we do that, it opens the doors to the miraculous that we're waiting. But so often, because we're not willing to give and to be stretched to that point, we miss out on those things that God wants to do in our lives, those things he wants to give back to us. But what happened is just like the church, when we embrace the tension instead of holding ourselves back, we see God do amazing, amazing things. And we can see what happens with, with Peter as well in verse six. It says this, the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened to, with two chains between two soldiers. 
and others stood guard at the prison gate. And suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awake him and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrists. And the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, as the, and the, angel, as the angel ordered. See, we have this church that is praying to the ends of themselves for Peter. And we have Peter, on the other hand, who is willing to quietly obey in a moment, without hesitation, to do exactly what he's told to do. An angel comes to Peter and essentially tells him to get up, get dressed, and get moving, because there is work to be done. We're not done yet. We're not called to sit stationary in a prison and accept that as our fate. God wants freedom for us. He doesn't want us to live in bondage. And that, that's the whole reason that Jesus hung on a cross so that we could taste freedom. He wanted to give us a chance at experiencing it. And yet how many of us are walking around in our own prison that we've created and God is telling us to get up, get dressed, and get moving. The work is not finished yet. There's more for us to do. I think of even this morning, things just were not going quite right which might be a little bit of an understatement. Nothing was horrifically wrong. They just weren't right. And really what that means is they weren't meeting my expectations of how I wanted the morning to go. And, and if you know very much about me, my perfectionism is a prison that I live in that God has been drawing me out of. And I stood there next to my friend and just quietly said, I'm feeling a little anxious this morning. And she looked at me and says, it's, it's fine, Amy. It's literally fine. Sometimes God sends us an angel that releases our chains, but sometimes he also gives us a friend that says it's fine. It's literally just fine. And it was. It was fine. Everything is just fine and worked out exactly how God wants it to be. But that is why community is so important. That is why being a part of a body that believes in a miraculous God is so important. Because sometimes God sends us an angel, but sometimes he sends us a friend that pulls us out of the prison that we've put ourselves in. That we refuse to step out of time and time again. How many of us aren't sharing our prisons with our friends? How many of us hold them tight and we don't speak them to the Lord and we don't speak them to one another. So nobody knows what we're shackled to. Nobody knows. And we all we are is we're walking around with the shackles. And we think that this is normal. This is normal. And friends, it's not. This is not normal. God does not want us to be walking around limping in bondage. He wants us to be free. Amen. So where in our life is God telling us to get up and get dressed and get moving? Because the work is not done yet. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, why aren't we willing to let the chains go? And I think that the reality is, is tension is not comfortable. The rubber band doesn't say, ooh, stretch me even more, <laughs> right? No, they want to be sprung back in their nice, fat, little, soft, squishy part. <laughs> but that's not where God shows up. He doesn't show up in the comfort. He doesn't show up when everything's going good. He shows up when things are tight. I believe that Jesus operates in that tension, and he wants us to be in that center of the tension. He doesn't want us being pulled to the left or pulled to the right. He wants us to maintain that tension because that's where growth happens. That's where the challenges are resolved and that's where God shows up. And that's where miracles will happen in our own lives if we just let him stretch us a little more. So what happens with Peter? Picking up in verse nine. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. He didn't realize it was actually happening. And he still obeyed. He still got up and got moving. They passed the first and the second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street. And then the angel suddenly left him. 
Peter finally came to his senses. And it's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where, he, where many had gathered to pray. You know, I, I, I think of the obedience that Peter had. It says he, he got up and he walked. He didn't argue. And, I, and I, I, the thought that comes to my mind is, is Jesse. And every time I tell him to do something, he says, why, Daddy? Why? What about this? Can I do this instead? But I want to do this. And it, or his new favorite, I need to tell you something. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, Daddy. And, you know, that, that gets me a little bit. I'll, I'll be honest. It, it, you know, it gets, you know, stretches me. <laughs> and, and you know what I say to him? I say, Jesse, just obey. Just obey me. Just do as you're told. And how often, and probably so much more of a loving, godly way, is our Heavenly Father just saying, just do as you're told. Just, just get up. Just get up. Let the, sh- let the shackles fall off. Walk through the gate while everyone else is sleeping. And let's just go there. And can you, I just, I'm in awe of the fact that we have Peter. He thought he was dreaming and he was still being obedient. He didn't argue. He didn't set conditions with God of what his freedom should look like or what he was going to do with it now that he had it back. He didn't set an expectation of, well, if it's not true, what am I going to do? He doesn't ask God whether it's real or not. He just gets up and follows God immediately. Immediately. He just obeys. And I wonder how often when, when things are not going my way, do I say, God, I just need it to look like this. God, I just want, I just want to not be anxious, but I want it to happen this way. Instead of getting up and getting dressed and get moving because there's work to be done, I lay a condition of what it looks like to get up and get moving. And that's not what Peter does. It's not. He doesn't even realize he's free until he's gone. And then what does he do, Matthew? Where does he go? He goes and he tells his friends. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's like he, he, we are, he's, he gets freed and he, he just, he gets dressed, and he starts his day, and he just, he follows. And I think, you know, the Holy Spirit wants to be whispering to us and wants to lead us and guide us. But we just have to do that first thing. We got to put our shoe on. We got to get our jacket on. We got to put our pants on. We got to be willing to go and do it and allow God to free us, and we need to be able to be willing to walk in that Peter goes to his fellow believers. That's the first stop he goes to. He goes to his community. And he says, look what God has done. He shares it with them. He doesn't take what God has done in his life and hold it close to his chest. There are some things God does just for us. But when we live in a community that believes in a miraculous God that is one body, we share it with one another. We go straight there and say, look what God has done. And we let them celebrate with us. We let them celebrate the way that we stepped out. Even when we weren't sure what it was going to look like. Even when it was scary because it didn't look like I wanted it to. And you know what? It's literally fine. It's just fine. Just do it and share it with one another. Share it in a way that lets God be magnified so that he can keep doing miraculous things so people keep seeing the fruit of being obedient so that we might become a body that doesn't hesitate when God asks us to do things that feel unusual, like walk out of a prison. Verse 13, it says, He knocked on the door at the gate, and the servant girl named Rhoda came and opened it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside to tell everyone that Peter was standing at the door. <laughs> You're out of your mind, they said to her. And she assisted, and they decided that it must just be his angel. See, Rhoda, Rhoda yeah. Rhoda reminds me of Grace. Rhoda becomes so awestruck that she doesn't know what to do with herself. And she kind of she comes undone a little bit. She kind of becomes a little 
frazzled. And she leaves Peter at the door. And that, that reminds me of Grace and how awestruck Grace is at the sight of the height of a horse. Her shock causes Peter to be neglected standing there. When he wants to share this miraculous thing that God has done, and nobody believes that it could actually be real. That leads us to our main point to this morning, which is don't neglect who's knocking at your door. See, when God shows up and frees you from prison, we got to let him. And when a fellow believer comes to share in the miracle that God has done, that God has taken place in their lives, we need to celebrate that. We need to let them in and express how wonderful God has been working in their life. We need to rejoice with them. We need to celebrate. We got to do that with Hunter today. We got to celebrate the work that God's doing in his life. And as a body of believers, that's so why community is so important to be together is because when we can testify and, and be encouraged by one another, our faith is built up and we can see and it just facilitates God doing more and more because we turn our eyes away from our inner problems and we get to look up and see what God is doing in the lives of each and every one of us. And that's what we need to do. We need to celebrate the tension that we're in so we can see God moving, we can celebrate the tension that God is working in other people. And when the miracle is right in front of our face, don't shut it out behind a door. When God is trying to do something for you, don't ignore it because it doesn't look like you thought it was going to. Open it. Let it through. And walk into what God has next for you. And don't be surprised. Let's, let's not be a church that is surprised that God heals, that God delivers, that God sets free. Let's expect that. Let's celebrate it. Verse 16 says this. Meanwhile, Peter continued to knock. <laughs> and when he motioned, uh, meanwhile, Peter, Peter continued to knock. And when they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. And he motioned them to quiet down, and he told them how the Lord had let him out of prison. And he said to them, tell James and the other brothers what had happened. And then he went on to another place. At dawn, there was great commotion among the soldiers uh, about what had happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for him. And when he could not be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. And afterward, Herod left Judea and stayed in Caesarea for a while. Peter kept knocking. When God does something amazing, be willing to share it with others. Even if you have to wait for them to let you in. Be willing to share it. People need to hear. We need to hear what God is doing in your life. We need to hear where God is showing up in one another's lives. And, and at the same token, after he shared it, what did he do? He stayed and then he moved on to the next place because the work was not done. We shouldn't expect God to do one miracle in our life. I expect God to do many miracles in our lives. We don't sit and live in what was done. We say, God, I receive it and what's next? Where am I going now? Let's do the next thing. Where are you taking me? Because we're not called to a season forever. We're not called to stay where we were. We do what he calls us to and we keep moving. We get dressed, we move on, and we let God do the next miracle for us. So who in your life are you willing to be stretched to the ends of yourself for? Do we say an earnest prayer at the moment and quickly move on to whatever's next? Or do we live in the tension with our brothers and sisters and wait and expect God to show up, to stretch us even more as we earnestly seek him for the answer? And when God does show up, who in our lives are we ready to run to, to celebrate and to testify about that with? Who are we sharing the good things that God is doing in our lives with? We talk about community a lot here in the Heights, and it's because there is so much goodness when we do life together. I mean, what happens, what happens for Peter and the early church is the epitome of what it looks like to do life as a community. 
people were undone for Peter, and it saved his life. And when he was rescued, he ran straight to them. That is the community we need to be. That is who we are called to be. I will be undone for you. I will go to the ends for you. And when God rescues you, come tell me. Come tell me that he saved you so that we can celebrate together. Because God is so much more than the heights. He's so much more than airway heights. He's so much more than the West Plains. And he says, even though he's more than all of those things, you matter. And he's going to show up for you here. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says this. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more that we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. What a wonderful declaration that is for each and every one of us that he still he still wants to accomplish even more than we could ever imagine through all generations it says forever and ever I'm reminded of Hebrews 13 8 that says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever and he wants to continue he wants to send his angels to set us free and to walk us through the prisons just like he did with Peter, he wants to do that for each and every one of us. He's not done yet, church. He wants to continue to transform us. Coming to the end of our capabilities is really scary. It feels like I have lost control and like anything could happen. And that is not a place I willingly go easily. However, coming to the end of my capabilities is exactly what God is asking of me. It's exactly what he's asking of all of us if we call ourselves Jesus followers. Will we let ourselves be undone? It is in the undoing where we learn to rely on a Savior who wants freedom for us who wants freedom in all things from, for us, whether it's shackles on our wrists in prison or my own self-serving desire to have everything go just so. Are we going to live in the tension? Will we embrace the tension that is living in this broken world while we're also living for our Savior? Our response to the world around us needs to be an opportunity to invite the miraculous into the lives of ourselves and those around us. Are we ready to step into a season as a body of believers to claim those miraculous things in our life, to be stretched as much today as the church was stretched for Peter? Or will we, or will we just continue to miss those who are knocking on Church, I want to invite us as a body of believers. Let's stretch ourselves for one another. Can we as a body of believers intercede on behalf of those in our, in our midst that are in need? Can we say, Frank, we're here for you. Ethan and Chloe, we're here for you. Tom, we're here for you. We're not going to give up until God does something great. And when he does, we're going to party. We're going to celebrate because we know the pain and the agony that has gone through. And we're here with you because Jesus sees the value in each and every one of us and he wants to be ready to break free. We just have to be willing to be stretched. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are still willing to do the miraculous, just like you did for Peter. Lord, that even right now you are stretching us to our very limits, and then a little more, just so we can cling to you 
in a new and tighter way. And Jesus, I ask right now, Lord, that you would be in our midst. Lord, that you would cause a great burden for each and every one of us to be stretched for our brothers and stretched for our sisters. Lord, let this not just be something that we, that things come to our mind and we, we pray, Lord. We say, Lord, be with them. But Lord, let us be on our knees. Lord, let the fire of God come upon us as we fervently intercede on behalf of our brothers and sisters for great things to happen. Lord, for bondages to be set free, for lives to be transformed, for relationships to be restored, for bodies to be healed in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, Lord. And we, Lord, we look forward to celebrating the great things that you are doing in our midst. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Matthew and Amy, those powerful messages this morning. Before we release you this morning, uh, just a quick reminder. If you want to stay connected, how to stay connected, what's going on, it's all through our app. We bring it up every week. Heights FC, if you that's you search in the app store, you'll see the arrows. Please check that. There's a, you scroll down and it refreshes your page. Uh, it's important because we don't print bulletins. Um, to go to the app during the week, you can put a prayer request in there. Actually, any time of the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that goes to our prayer team. And then we send it out and then we pray over those things. So it's important that you interact with the app. Um, To do that, as we have talked about, one of our values here is to connect like Jesus. And uh, we have an opportunity to do that uh, uh, during the week for a worship night coming up. So they're going to be here, extended worship and prayer time to gather, kind of kick off the fall. Say, Lord, here we are. Uh, Here's a a new season before us. We invite you to come to that worship night on September 20th. That information's on there. The second thing I want to bring up is they've talked about um, just freedoms and, and that tension Well, I don't know about you, but have you ever felt tension in your relationships before? Have you ever thought to yourself, my goodness, they do not understand the words coming from my mouth. Like you speak to people and you're like, I know I'm speaking English, but they are not hearing me. Or you feel like your fuse is very short. Well, God teaches us to love well, and we have one of our discipleship pathways, emotionally healthy relationship, which is one of the most practical One of the most practical ways to learn how to love people well, to communicate, to understand expectations, to learn not to read people's minds. And we're going to kick that off, a new uh, group. It's eight weeks long, um, and it's it's a wonderful experience coming together. And so you can sign up, guess where? App. Okay, we almost almost got that together. Our giving can also be done on the app. You can give safely there for your tithes and offering. We also have a box between the here and there and then out in the lobby. Now, before I send us with our benediction and uh, scripture this morning, one of our fun moments we uh, had earlier today was that our freezer went out last night. So our freezer is full of like half thawed, half not stuff. And so uh, if you didn't know with freezer, we do like a temporary food bank. We work with the food bank here. And so we have a lot of stuff that we store in there to give to people when they come in. And every week... uh, I help prepare a meal for the youth group, which comes out of there. And so one of my asks is, on your way out this morning, swing by the freezer. If there's something that you can see in there that you can cook this week, will you please take it? Because I have to empty out the freezer, and we're going to start all over. It's going to be okay. God's good. But I don't want to throw it all in the garbage. So it's right off the door. We'll be there. Grab something. Take it home. Use it. I don't want to throw stuff out. I feel blessed if someone could take some of that stuff home this morning. So we got those marching orders. All right, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up. Uh, Bob's on the prayer team today. Sharon, you can be on the prayer team too. Uh, You want to talk about uh, earnestly praying? These folks right here earnestly are praying in the tension for us each week, and there's lots of them here this morning. So here's a verse. uh, It's right before Matthew and Amy's closing verse. So I want to pray these words over you. It says, may you have power with all God's people to understand Christ's love. May you know how wide, how long, how high, and how deep it is. God's love, how wide and how deep it is. Be blessed. We'll see you next Sunday.